Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to Dark Academia Queen. If you're new here, please hit that like button, ring that bell for notifications, and subscribe. Help a girl out. Um, this I do have four other podcasts, and I also work two jobs. So, well, I'm also in school, so I'm doing everything I can just to keep the hype going. <laughs> But today we're going to be talking about a very known place. And if you clicked here, you probably want to know why I say that. Well, this this is our 39th episode and everything. But I do have something special planned for the 50th episode. So tune in. Hopefully you're still with me by the time this comes to an end. But if you... But... Today we're going to be talking about the Tower of London at night. This Tower of London. Well, the Tower of London is, uh, has a long history of torture and execution that uh, and that spans for more than 900 years. And the most famous of the many ghosts that live here are Anne Boleyn, the wife of Henry VIII. Now, I'm going to, now I could do a whole episode on that one separately, but for time's sake, we don't have time to do a whole episode <laughs> on just King Henry VIII and that whole scenario. But I do remember, um, divorce, beheaded, um, let's see, divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived. That's literally like the one when we, I was in my, um, one of my history classes, one of my, that's what my teacher literally, um, told us to remember and everything, to how we remember the wives. But anyway, Anne Boleyn, um, she was beheaded in 1536, and she was the headless body, uh, and you can, apparently, her headless body has been seen walking the tower corridors. So, other famous apparitions also include the White Lady, who is often spotted standing in the window of the White Tower, where she once stood to wave to her children, and the ghost of two young princesses who were sent to the tower after being deemed illegitimate by Parliament. It is also believed that the princes, um, that the princes were murdered in, by order of their uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, Gloucester, and that they are said to be seen holding hands and looking afraid. So. Let's do a brief history, okay? Shall we? So, one of the most iconic and historical sites in the world is, of course, the Tower of London. And it was not in it was not just the backdrop, but the lead actor in so many of the most momentous events in British history. Now, we can explore a lot of the fascinating history, but I don't have the time for it and everything's but so we're gonna focus on this one. But anyway, but this long and fascinating history reveals like Anne Bo- uh, many characters um as well, from Anne Boleyn to unexpected like spies, trolls, thieves, and polar bears. Now here, authors and historian Tracy Borman would investigate the tower, the Tower of London that was founded by William the Conqueror after his famous victory in Hastings in 1066. So, using part of the huge defensive Roman wall, known as the London Wall, William's men began building a mighty fortress to subdue its inhabitants of London. A wooden castle would be erected at first, but that was built in 1075 to 79, and would focus on the gigantic keep, or or Great Tower, which formed the heart of what was the 12th century, became known as the Tower of London. Although it was built as a fortress and a royal residence, it was long before the tower um, took on a number of other more surprising roles. In 1204, um, King John would establish a royal menagerie here. So, and also upon losing Normandy, the, that year, he also had many, been given the bizarre consolation prize of a three crate um, loads of wild beasts. Having nowhere else suitable to keep him, he settled for the tower. But John's son, Henry III, would embrace the aspect of the tower's full with enthusiasm, and it was during the reign of the, the royal menagerie that was fully established. The most exotic of all was Henry III's animals that was a pale bear. Um, and it was a gift from the King of Norway in 1252. Now, three years later, the bear was joined by a beast. Uh, was, 
a beast that was so strange that even a renowned chronicle, chronicler Matthew Paris was at a loss for words. He could only say it was eat and drinks with a trunk. Now, we'll probably talk about elephants at this point, right? I think we all can realize that. But England had welcomed the first elephant in eight. And that was right. Since the invasion of Claudius. It was during the 13th century that the London the Tower embraced another function that might not be as, um, expected as a, of a fortress, and is determined to keep the production of the coins under close control. Now, Edward I will move to Mint um, here in 1279, and his choice was inspired to keep to fornee security, and after all, the Mint workers literally held the wealth of the kingdom in their hands, and it was so successful that the operation here will remain here until the tower shut down in the 18th century. Um, now, at around the same time, the Mint was established. The tower also became home to a regular government records of government. For centuries, the monarch had kept these doc documents with them whenever they travel, but the growing volume forced them to be stored in permanent and very secure space. And during Edward's I reign, the tower became a major respiratory for these records. Purpose-built um, storage for the records were also provided here, there, and so they completed the space with weapons, gunpowder, prisoners, and even royalty. And that's what they meant. They will remain there for many centuries to come. So what about the rebel invaders? Well, it is said that he who had the Tower of London um, was the key to the capital. And it is um, the reason that it was always the target for rebels and invaders. Now, one of the most notorious occasions was the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, which was prompted by the introduction of a new poll to tax by Richard II's government. And under the leadership of the charismatic Walter Tyler, in June 1381, 20,000 rebels were marched onto the capital and head... That's it. That's it, 1381 and 2020. I'm going to go 1381. I think that's what I said. But we all know what happened here in the U.S. in 2020. But anyway. um, But in June 1381, the rebels were marched onto the capital and they're headed straight for the Tower of London. And the king agreed to meet them, but as soon as the gates were open to let them out, 400 rebels rushed in ransacking their way to the innermost parts of the fortress, and they will reach the second floor of the White Tower and burst into St. John's Chapel, chapel where they were found to despise, um, despised Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon Sudbury. Archbishop of Canterbury, that just sounds fun to say Canterbury. Anyway, without hesitation, they would drag him and his companions to Tower Hill and butcher him. It took eight blows of amateur executioner acts to sever the head of the Archbishop, and which was then put upon the pole of the London Bridge. So, meanwhile, inside the tower there was a mob that had ransacked the king's bedchamber and molested his mom and her ladies, and the contemporary chronicle John Frozenet described how the rebels arrogantly laid and choked on, choked on the king's bed, while several asked the king's mother to kiss them. Still from the more decisive action, his his son her son rode to meet the rebels and faced him their leader, Watt Tyler, who was slain by the king's men. With charismatic presence, the rebels lost the world to fight and returned meekly to their homes. So this is a site for great mystery. So Despite such dramatic events as this, the Tower of London's history has a prison that has always been the most fascination. Between 1100 and 1952, 8,000 8, people, give or take now, they were incarcerated within the walls for crimes ranging from treason to conspiracy to commit murder to from debt to sorcery. Now, one of the most notorious involved was the Princess of the Tower. Upon the death was of Edward VI, wait, yeah, Edward VI. Or is it Edward IV? Let me Google that real quick. Okay, fourth. It was Edward IV. Okay, I get those two mixed up, so I had to make sure I was doing 
making it correctly. Um, anyway, around Edward IV in 1483, his son and heir Edward was just 12 years old, so he was appointed to his brother Richard, the future of Richard III as Lord Protector, and Richard wasted no time in placing the boy and his younger brother Richard in the tower, Austin Sicily, for their protection. What happened next might have been the subject of very much intense debate over time. So, it is now widely accepted that sometime during the autumn of that year, two princes were quietly murdered, at whose hands it will never be known. And the prime suspect has always been Richard III, and who has invalidated his nephew's claim to the throne, and has himself crowned the king in July 1483. But, what they there were others that were invested interest in getting the princes um out of the way. The two princes had apparently disappeared without a trace, but in 1674, a remarkable discovery was made at the Tower of London. The then King Charles would order the demolish demolishes of what was remained the royal palace in the south of the White Tower, including the turret that had once contained a privy staircase leading to St. John's Chapel beneath the foundations of the staircase. The workmen were astonished to find a wooden chest containing two skeletons. They were clearly the bones of children, and the height coincided with the age of the two princes when they disappeared. Charles II eventually arranged for the burial in Westminster Abbey. They lie there still. And there was a brief interruption in 1933 when re-examining provided compelling evidence that they were the two princes. Now, the controversy surrounding their death reignited by discovery of Richard III's skeleton in Lassiter in 2012 and showed no sign of abating. So, let's talk about the executions and the imprisonment now. So, the Tudor period, we all know what the Tudor period was, right? Yeah, there was the War of the Roses and all that. There was the Tudor period and everything. So let's make sure we have our history correct on that. But um, the Tudor period witnessed four victims of the royal wrath more than any other. This was an area which a staggering number of high-profile statesmen, churchmen, and even queens went to block to the block. And the fortress came from an epitome, the brutality of the Tudor regime, and its most famous king. Henry VIII. So, the most famous of these tower prisoners during the Tudor era um, was Henry VIII's notorious second wife. Can we guess it? Can we guess it? Anne Boleyn. It was high end and unqueenly and soon made dangerous enemies at court. Among them was the king's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell. Now, why does that name Cromwell sound so familiar? Well, 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 I do plan on talking about this eventually. I want to say it's on... Yep, I do. It's going to be when I talk about the story of Oliver, Oliver Cromwell's head. It's an actual thing. I'm not crazy when I make this up. But anyway, but yeah. And almost certainly would be responsible for her downfall. He drew inspiration from the Queen's flirtatious manner with the courtier of male favorites and convinced the King that she was conducting many affairs with five of them, her own brother included. So, what were the final days of Anne Berlin? Where, where did she die? Well, Cornwall had all rounded up the queen herself and arrested May 2nd, 1536. She was taken by barge to a tower, stoutly protesting her innocence all the way, and incarcerated the same apartment that many refurbished for her coronation in 1533. Now, Anne would watch as five alleged lovers were led to death on Tower Hill on May 17th. Two days later, she was taken from her apartment to a scaffold, and after a dignified speech, she knelt down in the seat straw, closed her eyes to pray, and with a clean strike, the executioner served her head from her body, and the crowd looked on against the fallen queen's eyes. The lips of continued to move as if they were a silent prayer when the head was done. So, who, her nemesis, Thomas Cornwell, had also been among the onlookers of the mass of this spectacle, and his triumph would be short-lived. Four years later, he was arrested on charges of treason by the captain of the royal guard and conveyed by the barge of the tower. Now, he may have been housed in the same lodgings as Anne, 
and Captain Night Before His Execution, wouldn't that be lovely as well? And ironic at the same, same time. So, the death of Elizabeth I in 1603 signaled the end of the Tudor dynasty, but the Tower of London retained its reputation as a place of imprisonment and terror, and when it came clear that the new king, James I, had no intention of following Elizabeth's policies of religious toleration, a group of conspirators led by Robert Caspi hatched a plan to blow up the head of Lords during his stay of opening in Parliament on November 5th, 1605, and this will later become known as the Gunpowder Plot. And it's the only thanks to anonymous letter of authorities that the king and his um, Protestant regimes were wiped out. Now, the House of Lords searched around midnight, November 4th, just hours before the plot was about to be executed, and Guy Fox was discovered. And with 36 barrels of gunpowder, and more than enough to reduce the entire building to rubble. Now, Fox was taken straight to the tower, along with the fellow plotters, and they were interrogated by the Queen's house. One of which was the execution site. And... Fox would eventually confess, after suffering the agony of the neck rack, a torture device consisting to the frame suspended above the ground with a roller at both ends. The victim's ankles and wrists were fastened at either end, where the axles were turned slowly and the victim's joints would be dislocated. I'm not smiling, I promise. Uh, but anyway, um... Anyway, um, I lost my point. Oh, yeah, the victim. And so the shaky signature of his confession suggests that he was barely able to hold a pen. So, and he, he and his fellow conspirators met a greasy traitor's death at Westminster in January 1806. It is said that the gunpowder which they had planned on to use on James or Jeans was taken to the tower for safekeeping. So, what if this plot has succeeded. Well, Tower of London was again the center of action during the disastrous sign of James's son, Charles I, reign of, in which country will be led into a civil war. And after Charles' execution, you remember that name Thomas Cromwell? Well, Oliver Cromwell would order destruction of the crown jewels and the most potent symbols of the royal power. Almost all of which were melt, melted down to the Tower Mint. But upon the restoration of monarchy in 1660, Charles II commissioned a, commissioned a dazzling new jewels that are used that have been used by the royal family ever since, and they are now the most popular attraction within the Tower. So the crown jewels, um, although the Tower of London has fell out fell out of the use of the royal residence, it has remained a key for, for the nation's defense. The Duke of Wellington, now, was um, constable in the tower during the mid-19th century, stripped away many of its non-military functions, notably the menagerie, and built an impressive new accommodation for its garrison, which became known as the Waterloo Block. Now, this is home to the Crown Jewels as well. So, what happened to the Crown Jewels during World War II? Well, by the dawn of the 20th century, it seemed that the Tower of London role and fortress as a prison was a thing of the past, but the advent of the two world wars would change all of that. One of that was the notorious prisoner Adolf Hitler's right-hand man, Russell Hess, who was brought to London in May 1941. After landing unexpectedly in Scotland, possibly on a peace mission, he was kept at the Queen's house at the Tower and spent his comfortable four days if there before he was transferred to a series of safe houses. So, was Rudolf Hess the last prisoner to be kept at the Tower of London? It is often surprising to find that the Tower of London was still performing its age-old role as late as the Second World War, but contrary to popular belief, the last prisoner to be incarcerated there under very under very unusual circumstances, and even later, it was Churchill who ordered Rudolf Hess to be sent to the Tower of London after the Reich Minister's rather surprising arrival in Scotland on May 10, 1941. 
but he only remained a prisoner there until May 20th. And it was actually 11 years later after that the Tower of London opened its doors to its final, to its final inmates. So, who were the last prisoners? Well, it was the infamous Cray Trends. All the notoriety in which was the reason for them being put um, in, put in, the, in the tower. Indeed, it was the 1952 Reggie and Ronnie crime spree, who barely began, but they were nevertheless on the run from being drafted into a national service, having been called up to serve in the world full of serfs. They, they frequently deserted their regiment and recently gone absent without leave. During the most jaunt they were also able to recognize by a policeman and who attempted to arrest him and beat him for his troubles. The Crays, however, um, finally overpowered and were charged with um, assaulting a police officer before being handed over to her unit. And at the time, the tower was had been, happened to be a home um, to the barracks of the 1st Battalion, Royal Fossiers, the London Regiment, so the Cray brothers were duly carted off to their barracks and imprisoned there, marking them as the last inmates of this celebrated gal, of that gal. So, not that they enjoyed that place for long before they were shipped off to Shepton Military Prison for a month to await a court martial. So what about the Tower of London today? It remains a very much living fortress. It is adapted a chameleon-like to its change of circumstances while preserving centuries of tradition. It is still home to the royal famous yeoman warders or bee fitters as well as to ravens and at least a dozen of which must stay within the bounds of the fortress or legend has it the monarchy will fall. In 2014, the mark of the centenary um, of the beginning of the Fourth World War, the tower's um, moat was built, and there was about around 800,000, give or take, ceramic poppies, each of which representing a British or colonial military fatality during the war. During the war, so in blood swept lands and seas of red rapidly became one of the most iconic landmarks in London. It is visited by millions every year from across the world. And although it's no longer a bombardment from invaders, the tower nevertheless still prays to a steady encroachment of the city's new high rising, yet still stands as a bastion of the past, is instantly recognizable to the world. Um, but that's it. What do y'all think of the Tower of London? What do you think of this kind of thing? But anyway, join me next time as we talk about transcendentalism and the life of Walt Whitman, along with the legend of vampires. Um, and then we will go on to the New England vampire panic. Um, I'll see y'all next time. Y'all have a great day and stay cool out there. Try to stay cool. I know it's very hot, especially if you live here in the dirty south.